Kia ora, Tatu. Delighted to be here. It's my first time in New Zealand and I already love it. I wish I could stay longer. So thank you for the warm welcome and, and for the hospitality. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. You heard I'm a physicist. I'm teaching in higher ed, but I'm going to talk neither about physics. Well, maybe I'll sneak in a little physics later on. Um, nor about teaching in higher ed in particular. My, my story is really going to be applicable about any type of teaching. So I'd like to start some 30 or so years ago, more than 30 now, when I started teaching at Harvard. When I, when I started teaching, I never asked myself a question I should have asked myself right away, namely, what am I going to do in the classroom, right? Whenever you set out to do something new in your career, that should be the very first question you ask yourself. But the question didn't even come up in my mind. It was perfectly clear what I was going to do in my classroom at Harvard. I was going to lecture. Here's actually a picture of me teaching a long time ago. It's, it's actually a very old picture. You can see it's sort of grainy. This picture was taken B.C., before computers. <laughs> now, the reason I, I started lecturing was because that's how I had learned physics, sitting in a classroom. Actually, not very different from the setup that we have here, with the exception of the table stare. You know, listening to my professor's lecture. And I'm sure that they, in turn, made the same assumption when they started to teach. They had, you know, learned physics or whatever it is that they'd learned in a classroom not very different from the one I was teaching in. And so forth, back generations and generations, all the way to this guy here. This is a picture from a manuscript that was published in the 14th century. It shows a German guest professor giving a lecture at the University in Bologna in 1125. Now, with the exception of these funny robes, which nowadays we only wear at graduation, to remind ourselves that we're steeped in medieval traditions, um, that scene doesn't look that different from the one I showed you just a minute ago, down to some, you know, uncanny little details, like this one here. Look at this person here sleeping. By the way, I'm going to make sure that you won't sleep during this uh, keynote. Now, you know, I was asked to teach physics to pre-medical students. These are not students who want to learn physics. No, they already hated physics before stepping into my classroom. And most of my colleagues didn't want to teach that course because pre-meds are not very kind to physicists. And by the time it got to the end of semester evaluations, most of my colleagues came close to committing suicide. But not so for me. I got very high ratings, 4.8, you know, 4.5 on a, on a five-point scale. On top of that, my students ended up doing pretty well on the exams I gave them. So pretty quickly, I started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. Now, that turned out to be a complete illusion. It was a very pleasant illusion. Um, and that went on for many, many years. Until I finally discovered that I was probably one of the worst teachers. More about that later. Now, let's go back to that picture I showed you just a second ago. This one here. What is it that is actually going on in that picture. I would like you just blurt it out in one or two words to describe the activity that you see illustrated on the screen there. Ideally, I would like you to use a verb, but there are two verbs I do not want to hear, teaching and learning. So go ahead, blurt it out, and I'll repeat what I pick up. Note-taking, Note passive, consumption. consumption. Listening, 
demonstrating. Okay, so note-taking, listening, demonstrating, those are all things that you know, apply to either them or me. We're both in the same room at the same time. Is there a way that we can capture what is going on between them and me? Not just them or me. I mean, they may be listening, I'm not listening. They may be note-taking, I'm not, I can't, I'm talking. Demonstrating, I'm demonstrating, they're not. So how do we capture both what they're doing and I'm doing? Transmission, exactly. Transmission. Transmission of what, by the way? I think I heard it, but I want to hear other people chime in too. Content knowledge, I hear two words, knowledge and information. Think about it for a moment. Is knowledge something you can actually transmit? It would be great if you could transmit knowledge, especially if you could do it while people are sleeping. I don't think you can transmit knowledge. Knowledge is something that needs to be constructed in the brain of the learner. And I don't control their brains, they control their brains. However, transmission of information is exactly what I was aiming at. Lectures focus on the transmission of information. And you know what? Students actually rubbed that in my face very early on in my teaching career, and I managed to ignore it. You see, when I was asked to teach this course, as I told you a minute ago, I did not ask myself, how am I going to teach? What was the question you think did come up in my, in my mind? Not how, but what exactly? So I went to a colleague who had taught the course before, and I asked him that question, and he said, oh, in this course we use the book by Haldane Resnick. Some of you may know that book, it's been a classic for, I don't know, 60 years. And he also told me, and this came somewhat as a surprise to me, having been educated in Europe and not in the US, that most students would buy the book. I mean, having been educated in Europe, you know, I had figured out pretty quickly that you could just take notes and, you know, not spend $100 on buying a textbook. So why would you buy a book if, if the instructor is presenting the content of the book to you? Anyway, he told me that I had to be sure that the local bookstore I had enough copies of Haldane and Resnick in stock. So a month before the semester started, I went over to the local bookstore and I told the person in charge of buying textbooks, be sure that by September 15, you have 150 copies of Haldane and Resnick in stock. And as I was walking back from the bookstore to my office, I thought to myself, wait a minute, if the students have the book, and I have the same book, then what do I do in the classroom? So I stopped by my colleague's office and I knocked on his door and I asked him that question. And he said, oh, Eric, don't worry. There are lots of different physics textbooks. And he showed a shelf full of books that he had collected over the course of his career. And I started looking and very quickly, I found the perfect book. It was perfect for two reasons. One, it was different from Harold and Resnick, so at least I was not just simply regurgitating the content of the book that the students had bought. But that was not the important reason. The important reason was the book was out of print. So, for every lecture, I spent 10 hours preparing lecture notes, and then in class, I would either project those lecture notes on the overhead projector, Remember, this was BC, right? Or I would write them on the board behind me. And because my notes were different from the textbooks, I thought it would be good for the students to get a copy of my lecture notes. So at the end of each class, as they walked out, they could pick up a copy of my lecture notes. Now, why do you think I handed them out at the end of class and not the beginning of class? Why? So they stay, so they pay attention. But isn't that already admitting that there's a problem? I mean, why force the students to get the information out of my mouth if they could get it from reading the notes? <laughs> that never came up in my mind. But you know what happened? At the end of that first year, 
about half a dozen students wrote in the comment section of their end of semester evaluation, Professor Mazur is lecturing straight from his lecture notes. Hello. I mean, what was I supposed to do? Develop another set of lecture notes to lecture from that was different from the lecture notes I handed out to them? These ungrateful students. But you know, the students had a point. I was lecturing from my lecture notes. And if they would have looked at the textbook, they would have seen that the textbook is not that different. Now, this scene that I just described happens all over the world. Whether you step into classrooms in the US or in Europe or in Asia or in Australia or New Zealand or in Africa or in the Middle East, it's the same. You often see an instructor in front of the classroom delivering information to the students. So since this is happening all around the globe, <clears throat> you may well ask yourself the question, is that what education is? Is education merely the transfer of information? Let's make this interactive. I mean, I, I usually I bring clickers, but I thought we're not going to use technology. We're going to do low-tech. So here's the low-tech clicker. At the count of three, I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your chest indicating an answer. I'll tell you what the answers are in just a second. So one finger for one, two for choice two, three for choice three. I promise you there will be never more than five choices. So at the count of three, when I say one, two, three, you all will have to put your hand on your chest at the same time. If you do not, and this is particularly true for the people out on the bleachers there, if you do not put your hand on your chest, I'm going to point at you, or even worse, I'm going to come down the stairs, walk up to you, put this microphone right in your face, and you're going to have to tell the whole room what your answer is. I, I tell that to my students too, and then quickly they put their hand on their, on their chest. Instructions clear? Okay. At the count of three, is education just a transfer of information? One, yes. Two, no. Education is more than just a transfer of information. Ready? One, two, and three. Three? There, there is no three. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Good. So hold it there for a second so I can see. I, why don't you all raise your hand, not changing the fingers, and look around. I think we have a, an overwhelming majority of, of twos. I see a few ones there. I have a warning for those who had won. You are about to lose your job. Because let's face it, suppose that education was just a transfer of information. What would be the logical thing to do in the 21st century? Watching YouTube videos, I mean, film all the lectures that are being given around the globe in all the different languages, Chinese, English, Spanish, and put them on the internet. What would you lose by doing that to all of the classes that we teach. I mean, of course, we'd lose our jobs, but in addition to losing our jobs, what would we lose if we took all of our classes and put them online? I hear interaction, dialogue, but let's see, how much interaction is there really in a lecture-based class? I mean, I'm, I'm working hard on interacting with you. It's not easy. It's not easy because you probably walked in here thinking, I'm going to listen to Eric Mazur. You know, you, you walk here with, in a classroom with seats that are set up this way with the same mindset you walk into any theater or, or play or concert. You turn into a passive observer. And I make a habit whenever I visit different countries of, and I do the same thing on my own campus to colleagues of mine in other departments, is to walk in and sit in the back and observe some classes. And it's always the same thing. You know, we have some pretty good lecturers on, on campus. I love watching and, and listening to them. And animated people in front talking passionately about the, 
their subject, psychology or whatever. And then after a few minutes, they stop and they say, does anybody have a question? Anybody? And you know, the students look down. They don't want to make eye contact. And if the person waits long enough, it's always the same thing. Somebody in the front row, who the same person who reluctantly raises his or her hand. People do not want to interact. So I think we lose very little dialogue and very little interaction by taking everything and putting it online. But luckily, most of you had two. I agree, education is so much more than just the transfer of information. So now I'm gonna to turn to those of you who had two, the majority of you. What more than just the transfer of information is education? Go ahead, blurt it out. Knowledge, construction, I don't know if I got that all right. What, what else? Say it loud because the acoustics are not very good. Relationships. You see, as a learner, you need to do something with that information. It's not enough to open your skull, put the information in, and try to keep it in there as long as needed in order to regurgitate it on the exam. You need to take that information and extract from it the knowledge, the mental models that permit you to do something with that information. And it took a long time before I realized that the pre-meds in my class did not do that. They memorized, they learned how to solve problems by rote, but they really didn't make any sense of the underlying material. And yeah, I have to agree, <laughs> physics is pretty, you know, boring and, and pretty annoying if you don't see the beauty of the mental models behind it. See, after teaching and being under the illusion that I was a great teacher for many, many years, I came across an assessment instrument called the Force Concept Inventory. Do you have any people here who know what the Force Concept Inventory is? Raise your hand. No, so let me explain. It's a 29-question test. Well, now it's 30, but at the time it was 29. That test understanding of the concept of force, which in physics is one of the most basic concepts. If you don't understand force, the whole scaffold of physics collapses and it's impossible to make sense of energy, momentum, work, you name it. I mean, if you don't understand force as embodied in Newton's laws, forget it. It tests the understanding of Newton's laws by asking word-based questions. No equations, no drawings, no mathematics, nothing, just words. Let me give you an example. A heavy truck and a light car collide head-on on the highway. Is the force exerted by the heavy truck on the light car A larger than that exerted by the light car on the heavy truck? B, those two forces are equal in magnitude. C, the light car exerts a larger force on the heavy truck than the other way around. Now, every student in an introductory college-level physics class can recite Newton's third law. You may have heard about it. Action is reaction. Or the force of object one on object two is equal in magnitude to the force exerted by object two on object one. In equation, F12 is equal to F21. They all know that. But something amazing happens when you replace one by heavy truck and two by light car. They all forget about Newton's third law and they're convinced that the heavy truck exerts a larger force on the small car. When I first read about this, and you know, somebody had done extensive research on this, I said, no way. <laughs> not my students, not Harvard students. But you know, I'm a scientist, so I've learned not to make assumptions. So I thought, I am going to show that my students at Harvard ace this question. It took no more than two minutes for me to tumble out of my ivory tower because hardly had they started, or, or one student raised her hand. So I walked over to her, 
And this was not at the beginning of the course, this was at the end of the course, just two weeks before the final exam. And she looked at me and she said, Professor Mazur, how should I answer these questions? According to what you taught us? Or according to the way I usually think about these things? <laughs> You're laughing. I, I surely wasn't laughing. <laughs> I had no idea what she was actually asking me. And by the time this test had been completed, it was clear that my students had not even grasped the most basic principle in physics. So that made me completely rethink my approach to teaching. First of all, it became clear that I just had lived in some kind of uh, illusionary world. And I started to think, about teaching not as just a transfer of information, but as a two-step process. The first one is transfer of information, right? No transfer of information, no education. But it's not sufficient. There needs to be an opportunity for the students to assimilate that information, to make sense of it, to build the mental models that they can then apply to solve a problem outside of the context in which they've learned. I've often asked myself, where did that happen for me? Ask yourself, where did that happen for you in whatever field you chose to major in? Where did you make sense of the information? Where did you go, oh, I get it. Where did these aha moments occur? Did it happen while you were sitting in a room like this, listening to your instructors talk to you? I see lots of people shake no. Maybe on occasion it happens, but more often than not, it happened outside when you were, you know, pouring over your notes or talking to your friends and trying to make sense of the information. So in the traditional approach to teaching, and I think we're much more guilty of this in tertiary education than in primary and secondary, so I'm sure that most of you are much further along on the right path than people are at universities and colleges around the world. In the traditional approach, in class we focus on the transfer of information, and then outside of class we leave it to the students to focus on the assimilation of this information. But if you ask yourself, which of these two parts is the hardest one, I think we'd all agree. It's the second one. So it's kind of ironic that we take charge, we instructors take charge of the easy part, leaving the hard part to the students. We should really focus on this second part. So that's when I came up with the idea, this was 1990, so now it's 27 years ago, to invert, I didn't call it flipping it, I called it invert at the time, and then later uh, people started to refer to it as the flipped model. I said we should really invert this, change this sequence, and do the transfer of information outside of class so that we can focus in class on assimilation of the information. So, I'm going to talk later about that first step. To me, that's the easy part, the, trans the transfer of information. I want to focus on the second part first. What do you do in the classroom if the students have, you know, before they come to your classroom, at least taken the basics out of the way and by either watching or reading something, you know, prime the pump, so to speak. And the answer to that question, what do you do in the classroom under those circumstances, is actually nothing new. Teach by questioning rather than by telling. Who said that first? Socrates, exactly, over 2,000 years ago. Now, it's not that I went, oh, Socrates, no, not at all. It was a completely accidental discovery. You see, after I gave that FCI, the Force Concept Inventory, to my students, not only was I shocked, the students panicked because they were shocked by how poorly they'd scored and the final exam was just two weeks away. So they asked me if we, I could have a special session where I'd go through every single one of the 29 questions on that questionnaire or test. 
So I booked a classroom at night, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., and I went through every single question. 250 students in the class at that time. And I remember coming to this question of the heavy truck and the light car. And in my mind, I thought, it's, that's simple. It's, you know, it's just Newton's third law. What else is there to explain about it? So I turned my back to them and I made a drawing of the car on one side of the board, the truck the other. I drew the forces of gravity on each. I drew the force of the road up and then I drew the force of the truck on the car and the car on the truck and I turned around and I said, by Newton's third law, these two forces are the same. Well, what more is there to explain about it? I could at once see from their faces that they were confused. So I said, is there a question? They were so confused they could not articulate a question. I thought, this is serious. You know, maybe they're confused by the fact that the forces are the same, but the effects are different. The effects are different because the truck is so much heavier. So I should not only bring in Newton's third law, I should bring in Newton's second law, F equals MA. Anyway, I erased the board. I started all over again. In the next eight minutes, I managed to produce the most brilliant explanation you could possibly imagine. I mean, the whole board was covered with equations and drawings. I worked out the accelerations, you know. It, it, it was just fantastic. Of course, I'd done this all with my back to them. So at the end of those eight minutes, I turned around, my, my jacket covered in chalk dust, and they looked even more confused. And they could still not articulate a question. I, I didn't know what to do. I'd given it two tries. I'd given it my best. They still didn't get it. And I didn't understand what it was that they didn't get, and they couldn't articulate what it was. So in a moment of despair, I said to them, why don't you turn to each other and discuss this question? And something happened I had never seen in my classroom. Complete, utter chaos. I mean, they forgot about me in front of the class. I, I could have walked away. They, they would not have noticed it. What was even more surprising was that in just two minutes, they figured it out. And I thought, how can this be? I, the expert, have tried for 10 minutes in two different ways to explain it to them unsuccessfully. And they just talk to each other for two minutes and figure it out. At first, that didn't make any sense to me. But imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, John and Mary. Mary gets it and has the right answer. John does not. On average, I won't claim this always works, but on average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply by the force of logic. But this is not the important point. The important point is this. Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she has only recently learned it. She still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur learned it such a long time ago, in his mind it's so clear that he doesn't even know what is bothering a beginning learner. It's what my colleague Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge. Once you understand something, it's hard to remember the difficulties you had when you were starting to learn it. I saw that and I went, wow, I got to incorporate this in my class. So now I come to class, I talk a few minutes, I put a question on the screen. And after I put the question on the screen, next slide, I give time, time to think, it's silent. I tell my students, you're not allowed to talk to each other. Just think. And after they've thought for it for a few minutes, I pull them, next slide. And, you know, in the beginning we did it with hands on the chest like I just did. And then, you know, a few years later, companies started to develop clickers and, you know, now you can use mobile devices if you want. But I don't want to emphasize the technology because technology can be abused and a lot of people are just asking fact-based questions with clickers and you know, not getting the mind engaged because that's what it is about. It's about getting the brain engaged, not the fingers on the device. So I polled them and then after I've polled them, I try to aim the question so that somewhere between 30% and 70% gets the right answer. 
If it's in that sweet spot of 30% to 70%, I said, now try to find a neighbor who has a different answer and try to convince that neighbor of your answer. Okay, so chaos, they talk to each other. And that's when actually standing in front of the room, you'll see students go, oh, you see these aha moments in front of you. I often don't stay on, on in front of the classroom. I walk around to listen in and learn what it is that students are thinking. It, in a sense, helps me rediscover the thought process of a beginning learner. After talking for a few minutes, I pulled them again. And typically, if the answer of the, the, the percentage of desired answer is between 30 and 70 percent the first time, it can jump to 80, 90, or even high 90s after the discussion. And then I wrap up with an explanation, which can either be produced by somebody in the class or by me. And then the cycle repeats. And of course, the learning takes place in that discussion when students are talking to each other. Let me show you a little video clip of how this works. So we have a rectangular loop that is placed in a uniform magnetic field in the direction indicated by these arrows. So the question is, what are the magnetic forces on the four different sides of this loop? So take a minute to think about this and then enter your answers. So it's quiet. They're thinking like an exam, except that it's Please low enter stakes. Your there are no, there's no credit for it. We have a disagreement clearly here. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. Right. It goes out of the page the top goes in, so they right. cancel each other out. There is a torque. Did you see the aha moment there? Oh. Initially, we had sort of an even split. And now we have an absolutely overwhelming majority for choice number two. The bottom and and of that's this not unusual you, to have this, you know, transition from 50-50 to almost Maybe everybody for the desired answer. I don't show the first distribution to them. And that's also great when you have the hands on the chest. You know, students can't see. They might see a few, but they don't see the distribution as a whole. I do usually show the final uh, distribution. So what's going on here? One is it's active, not passive. You cannot be sleeping through my classes because every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you. Second thing, it's a two-way flow of information, not only from me to them, there's something coming back. If they don't understand it, I see it then and there. I don't have to wait until there's an assessment, a more high-stakes assessment. Three, it is feedback on the learning to the students. They can see where they stand relative to the class. If at the second polling they're still having A, whereas the majority of the class has B, they'll go, hmm, I better look at this. And lastly, it personalizes the learning. Student A can help student B. Student C can help student D, even though B and D have two very different problems. I can't do that. Students can help each other that way. Do you want to try it? Can I have a little bit more enthusiasm, please? Do you want to try it? Okay, good, good, good. So did you all read those two paragraphs on thermal expansion that were in your packet that I asked to be read before my keynote? No? Did, did we forget to hand it up? I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know what that means. That means I'll have to lecture you on thermal expansion briefly. Frankly, I'm very happy because, as you may have noticed, I love lecturing and I don't get to do it in my own classes anymore. So, so thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thermal expansion deals with the fact that hard materials like wood, actually this is steel, steel or wood or, or concrete, hard ones, not, not soft solids, hard solids, expand when they get hotter and they shrink again when they're colder. So if you put a pan on the stove, it gets bigger. I mean, don't tonight when you get home, don't try to put your pan on there and wait there for it to become twice as big. It's just a fraction of a percent, but it gets bigger. And actually it's very important 
in our daily lives, believe it or not. You may think, who cares about it? But you may have been in a train at low speed. Not very far from here, there are tracks. And if you look closely, you can see that the segments of the track are, you know, have little gaps in between them. Why? Because when it gets hotter, the steel expands. And if you don't leave that little gap, there's no space for that expansion, and bad things happen. The, the rail buckles. High-rise towers, like you have in Auckland, for example, you have to take into account the considerable expansion of the steel as the weather gets hotter. Next time you park your car in a concrete parking structure, like I've seen a couple downtown, after you leave your car, look down and you'll see that about every seven meters or so, there's a rubber strip between the concrete sections. The concrete expands when it gets hotter. If the concrete sections were right jammed against each other, they'd push each other out and that would compromise the integrity of the structure. So that, that rubber is there to absorb the expansion of the hard concrete. Likewise, next time you go to your dentist, ponder this. The dentist puts in a filling and that filling has to be chosen very carefully from a material called amalgam, which is a mixture of different metals, so that the expansion of that metal matches the expansion of bone. If it were just an ordinary metal, and then you drink your cup of coffee, you'd have a big problem because the metal would expand more than your tooth, and the tooth would crack. So just in case you think some expansion doesn't affect me, it does. Now, you may wonder, why is it that solids expand? Well, solids are made from atoms. I'm showing nine of them here. And atoms get further away from each other when it gets hotter. So this is, and it's all of them, all the, 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 the you know, millions of billions that make up a solid. Now, you may wonder, why is it that the atoms get further away from each other? I'm not going to ask you, but just to satisfy your curiosity. The reason is that atoms don't sit still, they vibrate. And the amplitude of that vibration is related to what we call temperature. So this is cold, this is hot. Cold, hot. So imagine you were an atom in, a, in any material, gas or solid, doesn't matter. Solid, you're nicely packed together like you are now in the seats there. You wouldn't just sit there like this. You'd actually be shaking. And as it gets hotter, you shake with a bigger amplitude and you need more space. So you're, you know, essentially pushing the, the atoms around you away. That's basically what is happening in a solid. So one slide back. Cold. Forward. Hot. And remember, it's not just the nine atoms that I'm showing there, it's the millions of billions of them that, next slide, that uh, are there. Questions, anyone? <laughs> Thank you for reaffirming that I'm an absolutely brilliant lecturer. <laughs> but look, I'm not just going to hide this this image here and then ask you the question, when solids get hotter, the atoms, um, you know, they expand because the atoms A get closer together, B stay the same distance, C get further apart. That would be simply me transferring information to you and then you transferring that same information back to me. I want to see if you can take this idea of the atoms getting further apart, all of them, and apply it to a different context. So you better ask me questions. Any questions? Yes, there. Oh, good question. I, I did not plant this question, OK? The question was, why didn't the middle one not move? <laughs> you know, you're not going to like my answer. <laughs> I'll tell you why the middle one did, is not moving. The middle one is not moving because I made two drawings in Adobe Illustrator. This one, and then that one, and I put the two on top of each other with the central atom on top of the other one. That's why the middle one doesn't move. <laughs> You're laughing, but it's the truth. Now, notice that that is a, ch it's a very good question, actually. Notice that that's a choice. I could equally well, unfortunately, my computer is not here, so I cannot show it, but I could equally well have taken the top left atom 
the black one, and put that on the top left gray atom. In that case, what would have happened to the middle one? It moved down and towards the right. And the one all the way at the bottom right would have moved twice as far. And the one in the middle on the, on the right column would not have moved towards the left, it would have moved down. You see, what matters is not the absolute position of each atom, it's the distance to the neighbors. And that would not have changed depending on the choice. And remember, in a real material, there are not nine atoms. There are not nine million atoms. There are not nine billion atoms. There are not nine billion billion atoms. No, there are billions of billions of billions of atoms. So the position of any one atom is actually meaningless. So thank you, excellent question. Okay, I think we're ready for the question, right? Consider a rectangular, by the way, now it's too late to ask me questions, okay? A rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it. Imagine we take this plate and we heat it uniformly. What happens to the diameter of the hole? Will the diameter increase? Will it stay the same? Or will it decrease? So here are the instructions. You are not allowed to talk to your neighbor now. If I see you talk, I'm going to come run down these stairs, come to you, and you're going to have to tell the whole room what you just told your neighbor, out of fairness, okay? So quiet. I'll tell you when you can talk to your neighbor. After you've thought about it, we're going to vote. And after the vote, you have to find a neighbor who has a different answer. You turn to your right. If that neighbor has the same answer, do not continue to talk to that neighbor. The left. If that person also has the same answer, do not assume that you're all right. Just, you know, the person behind you or in front of you, walk around. Your goal is to find somebody who has a different answer and then try to talk that person into your answer. Instructions clear? Okay, so think about this question. Okay, so remember this. At the count of three, you must vote. If you have not made up your mind, you still have to choose an answer, okay? Don't worry, this, nothing depends on it. I will not reveal your votes to anyone. Your, your salary will not increase or decrease based on your, on your choice. You must have your hand on your chest and vote one, two, or three. Ready? At the count of three. One, two, and three. Hold it there. Okay. Wow, I see ones, I see twos, I see threes. This is perfect. So go ahead, find somebody who has a different answer and try to convince that person that you're right and he or she is wrong. <laughs> Look at that. You got all fired up. I'm sure that by now most of you have forgotten that I am not here to talk about thermal expansion. I'm here to talk about education. The, the answer to this question doesn't even matter. I mean, I mean, imagine, imagine I'd given that same little lecture about thermal expansion, which you should have read before, but okay. Uh, that I'd given that same little lecture, and then instead of asking you the question the way I did, I would have said, let's now apply this to rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it. If you take one of these plates and put it in the oven and turn up the temperature, the plate expands and the diameter of the hole will... I'm going to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. <laughs> you would have been sleeping through it. I mean, what's more boring than metal plates with circular holes in it? And, and look at you now. Isn't it amazing how you can reawaken the curiosity of the human mind? I mean, many of you who are teaching kindergarten or even pre-kindergarten know that in a sense, we are all born scientists. Little children can't stop asking why, why, why. Our brains have evolved to want to understand the world around us. We're born with an innate curiosity about how things work. Unfortunately, education 
and I think we're all guilty of that, especially in higher education, does a very good job turning that innate curiosity off. And instead of the why, it becomes just give me the answer so I can pass the test. But the good news is I've just shown you how easy it is to turn that innate curiosity back on. And trust me, if you can do it with metal plates with circular holes in it, you can do it with any subject. Now, before I tell you the answer, let's analyze what happened here. I asked you a question, and you thought about the question. And after thinking about the question, I asked you to make a commitment. You made the commitment by putting your hand on your chest. We could equally as well as use the clicker. It doesn't really matter. And after you made that commitment, I asked you to turn to a neighbor and externalize your answer. And something interesting happens. I could see, I could see it from here. I didn't come down because there are no convenient steps here. But you actually turned from the answer to the reasoning that led to the answer. Many of you were gesticulating. In fact, there might still be some people in the back who are you know, trying to explain it to each other. That always happens. Don't worry. It's not about the answer. So you moved from the fact to the reasoning. This is a great way of bringing the thinking process, the thought process, back into the classroom. But perhaps most importantly, you became emotionally invested in the learning process. If I were to tell you now, Oh, sorry, I gotta leave. I have a flight in Auckland. Bye. You know, you'd come running after me to ask me what's the answer to that question. Now, before I can tell you the answer, you need to vote a second time. Next slide, please. So, I want you to vote a second time indicating what you now believe to be the right answer. If you've not changed your answer, you put the same thing, one, two, or three. If you have changed your answer, put what you now believe to be the right answer. At the count of three, one, two, and three. Down, down. Okay. Oh, my God. Oh. You know, you know, I thought I gave a pretty darn clear lecture about thermal expansion. Yet, less than one-third got the right answer the first time. You should really have read your, you know, my notes before coming to this keynote. The correct answer is... Oh, look at that. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me. I mean, it's, you know, before that, there were people typing and tweeting. It's, it's not a single person is, is texting or tweeting right now. The right answer is, can I have a drum roll, please? Number, next slide, one. <laughs> Don't get too excited. This is just a metal plate with a hole. Now, isn't it amazing how you can get people excited, you know, with something, you know, just Pretty simple. Now, look, there were more ones than after the talking than before, but there was still a large fraction of people that had three. And I, I don't want you to lie in bed tonight at 2 a.m. wide awake. <laughs> so let me take another minute of my precious time to, to sort of explain this. Imagine you have a jar of marmalade in the refrigerator, you take it out. It's a glass jar with a metal lid. And you try to open the lid, and you can't, you can't open it. It's too tight. What do you do? You run the metal lid under hot water. So the ring becomes bigger, and therefore you can take it off. You say, well, you didn't ask about a jar. You asked about a metal plate. <laughs> OK, fair enough. I wish I had a piece of paper. Can somebody give me a, just a blank piece of paper? So imagine you have a, well, I, I, you just imagine it, okay? Imagine you just have a metal plate, no hole in it. You draw with a marker, it's okay, I, oh, okay, okay, so 
here's my, here's my metal plate. No hole on it. Now I take a marker and I draw a circle. Okay, so I have a, a plate with a circle on it. I put this plate with a circle on it in the oven. I turn up the temperature, the plate expands. What happens to the diameter of the circle? gets bigger. Everything gets bigger, so the circle is going to get bigger too. You say, that's unfair. There was no hole. If there was a hole, then the atoms would have expanded into the hole, which is why many of you had number three. I'll show you what's wrong with that line of uh, reasoning. Next slide, please. So imagine that, you know, we all go outside in the grass next to the Claude Lens event center, and we we hold hands, forming a big circle. Every one of us is an atom at the edge of the hole. Can you imagine that? Big circle. I'm one of you. Now we step in towards the center of the hole. What just happened to the distance between us? Ah, it got smaller. We cannot get closer to our neighbors because we're shaking more and they're shaking more. The only way to make the distance larger is either to remove a few of us, but atoms don't disappear like that, or to make the hole larger. <laughs> okay, back to peer instruction. Next slide. I'm going to wrap up here in the next 10 minutes or so. So the first time that I implemented it, I doubled the learning goals. I didn't just Im improve them, you know, 10% or 20%. I doubled them from beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. And after using it for a few years, I actually tripled the learning gains. And a study done at Carnegie Mellon showed better retention. And the studies have meanwhile been replicated in many different fields and across many different um, educational settings from you know, primary to high school to, to uh, higher ed. So I want to wrap up by basically discussing something that I shoved under the rug. Essentially, this whole first part of my talk, the second one will be much shorter, don't worry. <laughs> uh, I talked, you know, let's eliminate this transfer of information. And I sort of shoved that under the rug. I said, you have your students um, read or watch something. But it's not that trivial, because if I just would have told you yesterday, I sent you an email or whatever, here, read these two paragraphs on thermal expansion, I bet that many of you would not have done it, because you would have expected me to do it in the classroom. So a few years ago, I started to think, you know, I, I must really think of a good way of transferring information outside of the classroom. The first thing I thought, since I'd recorded all of my lecture on video, next slide, I thought, you know, let's have students just watch the video. However, next slide, um, you know, in that case, something happens that is the same as when you speak. You see, when I speak here as an instructor, let's say that I let, take my little lecture on thermal expansion, your mind was held captive by my speaking. See, that's one of the big problems with lecturing. There is no time for the learner to pause and think. Have you ever had a student in your class raise his or her hand and say, professor or teacher or whatever, could you please be quiet for five minutes? I need to think. It's never happened in my class, but you have to admit, if you have to think about something, if you have what Piaget called the cognitive dissonance, that would be the right way to create space and time to think and to ponder. Now, with the video, you have sort of the same thing. You could pause the video, but it turns out students do, don't do that. I've looked at the data from edX. You know what happens when students watch pre-lectures on video? They turn up the speed. I thought that, you know, my, my daughter, who was a student at Harvard, recently told me that when she watched, she put the speed at 2.0. I can't even believe how you could, you know, think about anything. They want to get through it as fast as they can. And again, there's no time for the brain to really absorb the meaning of what you hear. Also, by watching a video, you're passive, the same as passive listening in a classroom. The other thing is that the data shows that the students very quickly find out that they can game the system by fast-forwarding through the video and then jumping to the 
you know, quote unquote assessment at the end and just, you know, do a scattershot approach at answering the question, pretending that they've done the work. But most importantly, this, it's an isolated individual experience. You and the video. So in essence, what happens by having students watch the video is that we're you know, removing this from our direct eyesight, and at least it's not happening in front of us. So then I thought, let's move to the book. There's a big advantage to reading, because now the transfer pace is set by the reader. You determine at what pace you read. And if your mind wanders, you stop reading because you can't read and wander at the same time. And if you need to reread something, you reread. You're in control of the transfer pace. And a lot of research has shown that the brain is much more active reading than it is watching or listening. Our brains are very visual. A lot of part is involved in translating the abstract meaning of letters into concepts. However, books too have a problem. First of all, it's still an isolated individual experience, whereas Education deep down is a social experience, not an individual experience. And lastly, there's no real accountability. How do you know if you tell your students read chapter 22 that they will actually read? The solution turned out to be something that I should have thought of much earlier given what I had done. What is it that we want? We want every student prepared for every class at the beginning of the term and at the end of the term. And ideally, I don't know about you, but that's certainly true for me, I want that without having to put in extra hours. I'm already working hard. The solution is very simple. Turn the out-of-class component also into a social interaction. You see, I'd worked hard on making the class a more social interaction. I'd never thought about making the out-of-class experience, learning experience, a more social. So we developed a platform which is free called Perusal, Perusal, Perusal for all, um, with which we can guarantee every student prepared for every class, or at least as close as we can get. At its heart, it's a social learning platform. In fact, if you log in, and you log in through you know, your favorite social network, um, once you've logged in, it looks like an e-reader except that there is a twist. You can see in the top right corner who is online reading the book at the same time as you are. And if you have a question about a passage in the text, you can just highlight that text. And as you highlight text, it opens a chat window. And in the chat window, you can type in your text. And uh, once you've typed in, you know, I don't understand why, blah, 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 and you hit return, the highlight sticks. After a while, the pages will be marked up with highlights from other students in your class. It's sort of partitioned by class, not the whole world. And you can uh, click on any highlight, and it opens that chat transcript that is attached to that passage. So on October 20, one student wrote, about a year ago, I don't understand how this combination of factors tells you anything, blah, 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 and so on. Uh, two hours later, no, half an hour later, another student with the initials SB said, I think you may be able to think about the direction separately, blah, 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 blah. Two days later, on October 22nd, a third student says, this is a great question. To further elaborate on this, we can blah, 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 and so on. In a sense, what you see here is asynchronous peer instruction between students outside of the class. Asynchronous in the sense that they not have to be in the same spot at the same time together like they are in the classroom. So Facebook has like buttons. We don't have like buttons. We have two other buttons. One is a question button. If you ask a question, it will automatically get tagged as a question. But if you're another student who has that same question, you can click on that question flag, incrementing a counter. Yes, I'd like to know the answer to that question too. Which means if somebody follows up, you get alerted to the fact that somebody has reacted to that question. And if an explanation is particularly helpful, you can click the this helps me flag. And as questions get upvoted or answers get upvoted, they go towards the top so that other students can learn from it. So um, let's go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, I'm going to skip this. There's a way of notifying each other via email. It's unimportant, so I, I'm going to fast forward. Next slide, next slide. So here's the big question. How do you get students to participate? Ideally, I don't know if any of you know um, Ellen November. Yeah, has he been here to this conference? I'm going to make a plug for Alan November because he is one of my heroes in K-12 education in, uh, in the U.S. He wrote a book which had a profound influence on me, which had the title, Who Owns the Learning? In most educational settings, it's the instructor owning the learning. It should really be the learner owning the learning. Learning, as you know from small children, is intrinsically motivated. You don't need to tell them to learn. They want to learn. And somehow... We destroy that intrinsic motivation. I am very much an advocate for intrinsic motivation. However, I know from my own students at Harvard that if I count on intrinsic motivation, I'm going to get nowhere. So essentially, we use a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation drivers. So let's try with the extrinsic one, the stick, and then we'll talk about the carrot later on. So essentially, we use a rubric-based assessment for their annotations. And we tell the students that they must demonstrate through the annotations in a given assignment, thoughtful reading and interpretation. So if all they do is highlight pieces of text and say, I don't understand this, I don't understand this, I don't understand this, they get zero because you can just do that without any engagement. If you write, I don't understand this, because on page 256 it says blah, 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 blah. At least we know you're trying to connect things, so you get partial credit. If you highlight something, you say, I don't understand this, because on page 256 it says blah, 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 blah. And I thought that, and you reveal your thinking process, you start to get full credit. And we want to sort of, uh, uh, you know, one annotation won't be enough, so we want a certain quantity, depending on how thoughtful they are, there can be fewer. Or, or more. We want them to be on time before class starts, although much to my surprise, many students continue to use this platform to elucidate their understanding after class. And lastly, we want them to be distributed throughout the text. We don't want students to have a 10-page assignment and put all of their notations on the first page and then say, I'm done. With this rubric, in my class of 60 students at Harvard, <clears throat> in one semester, 20,000 annotations. The students write more than the author of the textbook. <laughs> so I can already hear you think, you know, how do you process all of that? Well, it's fully annotated. We use actually a specialized machine learning algorithm to assess the intellectual content of these um, of these annotations. And we've shown, this paper is appearing soon, but we can share a preprint. The, in fact, it might be on the perusal website, I'm not sure. It exceeds intercoder reliability. In other words, if you take the rubric and two different human coders, they'll agree to about 75% because this interpretation is, you know, not completely objective. If you then train the machine with a training set from one of the coders, and then you take a new set of, let's say, 500 annotations, and you have the same person coded in the machine, the machine tracks that trainer you know, up to about 80%, so better than another human being would do. So immediately after the assignment, you have a grade book for your students showing you know, the names of your students. This is from my class, so I had to blank out their names, and you can click on, on any grade and see, you know, total number of annotations, whether they were on time, whether they were thoughtful or not. But it gets so much better than that because you can actually connect the pre- and in-class activities. You see, when I started doing this in my class, I did this to solve one of my problems. I never thought of making it available, but then other people started to express interest in it. I, my hands were itching to look at the questions that the students had before coming to class because it's like a window into their brains. You can see what the questions have and you'll go, oh. You see all of a sudden your students interpret a word that is used in the book very differently from the way you interpret it and the author had meant it. Well, if you don't know about it, how can you ever address it? But if you know it, you can actually do something in class. 
But it's kind of a pain to have to click on all of these annotations and weed through them to find out what the questions are. So I thought we need another algorithm that determines what the biggest outstanding questions are that have not been answered by others in the class. So you click on a button and you get what is called a confusion report. The three main questions that the students have. This is from a class at the University of Central Florida and the students in a chapter on magnetism had questions about the right hand rule, the direction of the magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field. Here's one student who asked, why is it that the magnetic field puts away from the North Pole and towards the South Pole, when on the previous page it stated the direction of the magnet field is the direction that the North Pole of a compass needle points. Really good question. Turns out that the textbook that they were using there did not explain that the North Pole is a magnetic South Pole. Well, if you don't know that, it is indeed very confusing. You know, you might not be aware of that as a physics instructor because in your mind, it's clear, so you just gloss over that. But now, I can walk into class and I say, thank you for your good annotation. It appears that the questions that you had clustered around three concepts, the right-hand rule, the direction of the magnetic field, and the Earth's magnetic field. One of you asked this question, cut, paste. And the students go, wow, he actually reads our annotations. Yeah, I read nine of them, but they don't need to know. So it's a great way of, of you know, connecting back to the work that the students do out of class. So what is the intrinsic motivation? It's a social interaction. It's actually fun to be online. You can chat with each other live while being in the, in the book. Um, and then, of course, there's the connection to the in-class activity, and then there's the, in, the extrinsic one, which you can turn off if you don't need it. So in some graduate classes, we actually turn that off. But it's fully automated, so you don't need to worry about it. Okay, I need to wrap up here. Um, here's one student from my class actually said, I think the perusal app and annotation are way better than just reading a textbook normally. I've been reading for almost four hours now and I haven't gotten bored. Of course, he was reading the textbook that I wrote, so. <laughs> um, here's an Ohio State student in a 600 student chemistry class. It makes the book fun to read. All the other students on my floor are disappointed their prof isn't using perusal because they don't read the book. So I want to show you some really stunning data and then I'm going to uh, stop here. So this shows on the vertical the percentage of students in the class and on the horizontal the number of chapters that they missed over the course of a full semester. They had to read 17 chapters over the course of that semester. I'd only show up to six because everything else is zero. So, and the three different shades are three different semesters, with the dark one being the most recent one. We were tuning the algorithm. So, you know, three semesters ago, there were some students who, or maybe one or two, who missed six chapters. But in the latest one, no student missed more than four. But now look at that first peak. 70% of the students misses zero chapters. Zero. I don't know about you, but I sometimes miss deadlines, right? And if they get sick or they have an exam or whatever, you know, so it's pretty amazing to get that to 70. In fact, if you add the first three bins and you add them all together, it's close to 95%. I think this is as close as you can get to every student prepared for every class. You know, even if you were, you know, threaten them with incredible penalties. They, you, you'd never get over that. So we have lots of additional research data, which um, we're publishing actually right now as I speak. Um, there's a very significant engagement, and we also have a lot of information on their annotation habits. In fact, the great thing is that with now about 110,000 users across the globe, we're generating so much data that from just the clicking in the text, we can already predict their level of engagement by just analyzing those data. And at Ohio State, in that big class that I mentioned, they did a surprising study. They had part of the class use perusal and part just use the textbook. The part that used perusal scored significantly higher on the traditional assessment than the others. So, virtually 100% completion of assignments, which is great because that allows you as an instructor to focus on what really matters. 
getting their brains engaged in the class rather than transferring uh, information. You can use your class for something much more productive than just talking to your students. And the great thing is, you know, it's essentially free and no uh, additional instructor effort. Okay, finally, um, to wrap up, I hope I've convinced you that education is not just about transferring information. It's so much more. And it's not about getting students to do what we do. I want my students to stand on my shoulders. I want my students to solve the problems that I cannot yet solve. We want the next generation to solve the many problems that this society faces. And when I mean this society around the globe, water, energy, conflict, you name it. Things that we cannot tackle, which they will need to tackle. And I think in order to do that, we must equip them not just with knowledge, but with the appropriate thinking skills. And in order to develop those thinking skills, this active engagement, both in the classroom and outside the classroom, is an absolute must. Thank you for your attention.